quantum mechanics internal motion, what to learn from de Broglie, recently published. Quantum mechanics is built on wave-particle duality, the wave for interference, the particle for inertia. There are two pillars, Planck's law, energy is proportional to frequency, and de Broglie hypothesis, where momentum is inversely proportional to wavelength. That's where we will start to talk. We learn by understanding this fact. Every physicist knows that in plane waves, the product of the wavelength with the frequency tells you the velocity of the wave moving from left to right or right to left. Lambda times F equals V. But de Broglie found otherwise. His momentum is equal to mv, and de Broglie's p is proportional to 1 over lambda, is the inversion of the physics we just noticed. Momentum is proportional to lambda. They're inverted. How do we understand it? Why now? Because YouTube has recently published an interview with Louis de Broglie by Grive, given some time ago. But uh, there are also other interviews which bear on this matter. Richard Feynman said of quantum mechanics, it's crazy. It doesn't explain anything. It just gives you numbers. He also said, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And I hope you won't agree with him. Einstein was more critical. The wave function does not provide a complete description of the physical reality. So what is the way forward? I'm going to ask you to consider wave groups and wave phases in bow waves, like the waves that trail an ocean liner. You can see the groups moving away from the uh, uh, from the ship, uh, and inside the groups you can see uh, surface ripples. There's bulk motion and surface responses, and we need to understand how relativity connects them in matter. The issue is internal motion. Dirac wrote that in the theory of the electron, we shall have to introduce an extra degree of freedom describing internal motion. But he said very little about internal motion. I'm going to ask you to consider the wave packet as the origin of internal motion, which we will uh, apply to Schrodinger's theory and Heisenberg's interpretation. Schrodinger's theory allows you to calculate eigenstates of a Hamiltonian matrix, uh, and uh, this is very convenient in calculating chemistry phenomena. The theory is non-relativistic because mass energy is taken as constant and ignored. Heisenberg's interpretation is relativistic. Uh, it's distinctly mathematical, using Poisson brackets and commutators. For example, Dirac calculated the speed of the electron using this anti-commutating -commu operator. And he found that the speed of the electron is equal to the speed of light. He wrote, this means an altogether different relation between velocity and momentum from what one has in classical mechanics. We can conclude that a measurement of a component of a velocity of a free electron is certain to lead to the result plus or minus c. I don't know how he got away with this in the light of special relativity. Heisenberg's interpretation has other features. It's indeterminate and discontinuous. It uses spooky action at a distance. It's instantaneous in time and it has no wave packet. By contrast, the wave packet with relativistic internal motion, 
uh, has a quantum which is due to harmonic interactions at creation, annihilation, etc. Measurement is real with wave particle temporal and spatial uncertainty. The interactions are continuous in time and space. What is the wave particle? We add to wave particle properties of light at the end of the 19th century. We add Planck's law, the de Broglie hypothesis that we've already mentioned, and include them in Einstein's special theory of relativity using natural units. And what do we get? Mass is equal to omega squared minus k squared. Omega is the angular frequency and k is the wave vector. This equation separates into two, a conservative part, which describes mass, charge, spin, energy, momentum. It's the envelope of the wave packet. And a responsive part, which describes interference, superposition, etc., etc., resonant collapse, which is an infinite wave with unit amplitude for all x and t. Notice that sigma is the half width, roughly, of the wave packet. And the normalizing quantifier A quantifies the quantum so that you can count them, one, two, three, and four, etc. We can, we can operate on these equations in many ways. We're going to take, for today, just one, and we're going to skip the Fourier transform, which describes uncertainty. When we differentiate that relativity equation, we the, the differential is equal to zero of these constants. And when we differentiate this part of the equation, we find a very important result. Omega over k multiplied by d omega by dk is equal to c squared. Omega over k is the phase velocity. d omega by dk is the group velocity. And we'll say more about those in a moment. The quantized wave contains two velocities for its group and its phase. Light is a special case. The phase velocity and the group velocity are equal to c, both of them. In the electron, the phase velocity is the inverse of the group velocity, and mass is greater than zero. We've got a problem. Think of a bubble on a wave here. As the wave passes through uh, uh, from left to right, the bubble moves up and down on the top of the wave. Actually, it executes an elliptical trajectory. But the net motion in the horizontal direction is zero, so there's no momentum. So how do we make this wave produce momentum? I'm going to consider a, a tuning forks. Consider a tuning fork putting out a sound wave, which we represent with this uh, term in an equation. Notice that it's maximum when omega t equals kx. Uh, and that implies that x over t is equal to omega over k. So the speed is equal to omega over k. Uh, and uh, that's the phase velocity. Now what happens if you have a tuning fork with one fork weighted? Uh, piano tuners uh, often have this experience that they, the way the sound is heard it beats. And uh, we can superpose the two waves, take out the carrier wave, which is the same as the one we started with, and uh, it's enveloped by a beat with velocity d omega by dk, using the same treatment as we had just here d omega by dk is less than omega over k. So we produce a beat wave envelope on the carrier of this form, 
and the beat results in transport of, ment of momentum because of the phase difference between omega over k and d omega by dk. Well, what we need to do now is to find the group velocity in relativity and integrate over the symmetric wave group for the free electron or photon. We'll look at the data. The data is irrefutable. It's gained by many decades of electron microscopy and other particle accelerators. When we make measurements in the electron microscope, and the millions have been made, we need to know the energy of the uh, uh, electron probe. Uh, often we need to know the wavelength, the mass, the velocity, the frequency, and other uh, parameters which we can calculate. And I'll show you how we can calculate them. We use the relativity formula, and we notice Pythagoras' theorem. mc squared, energy, momentum. Uh, the mc squared for the electron is known. The uh, energy is the electron mass energy plus the acceleration energy of the electron gun. And uh, the vector joining these two vectors with the right angle is the momentum uh, of uh, the uh, electron probe. And with this knowledge, we can calculate the frequency and the wavelength and uh, tabulate the results. This is a logarithmic tabulation. Energy of the probe, 10 volts, 100 million volts, and uh, calculated frequency, wavelength, phase velocity, group velocity, product, this is linear, and uh, uh, the ratio, phase velocity divided by group velocity. All the other values are logarithmic. And what do we find? V, the phase product of the phase velocity and the group velocity is always equal to 1. In matter, the phase velocity is greater than C, the group velocity is less than C, as in relativity. And these tabulations are plotted here. The product of the phase velocity and uh, the product of the wavelength and the frequency gives the phase velocity. It's equal to C at high energy. At an energy of half a million volts, which is the re rest mass energy of the electron, the non-relativistic part separates from the relativistic part and the phase velocity is always greater than C. The group velocity is the inverse of the phase velocity is less than C and it tends to zero uh, as the wavelength gets very large. The product of these two is 1 as we saw in the table and the ratio of phase velocity to group velocity is equal to 1 uh, at high energy and increases as the energy gets lower. And we can come to some conclusions. The riddle is solved. Uh, de Broglie's implicit velocity is the group velocity, not the phase velocity. And we have two calculations in relativity which take you from momentum as relativistic mass times group velocity. Group velocity is c squared over vp. That's uh, a relativistic result. And uh, vp is equal to uh, uh, f times lambda. Uh, and uh, with a little bit of cancellation, we find y, the momentum, is equal to h over lambda as uh, uh, de Broglie had it. This is no longer a hypothesis. This is obvious theory. Uh, the experimental fact is due to relativity, twice over. And we can come to some conclusions. Well, what have we learned from de Broglie? The wave packet has internal and external velocities. The internal wave velocity of the wave response and the external group velocity of particulate motion. De Broglie's momentum is a property of the bulk group. 
even though lambda belongs to the wave response. Relativity determines how the velocities relate. Momentum is proportional to group velocity. Group velocity is the inverse of phase velocity. The phase velocity is proportional to wavelength. The free electron of kinetic energy, 10 electron volts, has a, uh, 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 has a phase velocity which is 10,000 ti 10, times greater than the group velocity. This allows space and time for collapse of the wave packet to occur in the physical domain by resonant response of wave packets. This uh, is a solution to the uh, traditional collapse of the wave packet problem in quantum mechanics. There are many other consequences which I've noted here and which are cited in these references. There's a lot to be learned from de Broglie.